here. We can hide here. We probably got bandages and stuff. Mom knows what to do. Ah. Uh. Line. Looks like some kind of fucked up performance art. Hands Across America took place on Sunday 25th of May 1986 and it was an event which saw roughly 6 million people hold hands for 15 minutes and form a line which spanned the length of America. The aim of the event was to raise between 50 million and 100 million dollars for homeless charities. Most of that was due to be collected from donations with people pledging between 10 and 35 dollars to reserve a place in line for which they would get a free t-shirt. The route itself stretched from Long Beach, California to New York and among the people lined up you had a wide range of celebrities including Oprah Winfrey, Yoko Ono, Kenny Rogers and Don Johnson to name just a few. Also in attendance was Ken Cragen, a TV and film producer who was the organiser of Hands Across America and who had been heavily involved in the previous year's USA for Africa. Now, these days, Hands Across America has, outside of its connection to us, and more on that in just a bit, kind of been swept under the rug a little bit, and for pretty good reasons, considering that it was something of a farce. So, the target was 50 million to 100 million. In total, only $35 million was raised. And now, part of that was because some people made a pledge to reserve their place in line, and then just didn't pay. But I suspect that a large part is that as a charity event, it was misjudged and very poorly conceived. So first things first, Hands Across America was a massive logistical operation that took 400 staff over nine months to organize. As a result, you naturally have all manner of non-charity related things you need to think about because for such a big event, you need to make sure that investors and sponsors are involved, that TV networks are on board and that all of your promotional stuff is in place. Ironically, it all costs a lot of money. In fact, it costs a large chunk of the $35 million you've collected, which means that in total, only about $50 million ever goes to charity. So this is evidently what happens when you commit to a charity event, kind of for the sake of doing the event. And what I mean by that is that Hands Across America was in part conceived because Craig and Co wanted to do a bigger event than USA for Africa, meaning that part of the impetus for Hands Across America was not to do a charity event, but to outdo USA for Africa. Which is a bit like working backwards from the event to the charity, rather than finding the event to fit the charity. So naturally, by committing to this thing, you're gonna have to divert a lot of time and energy and money into proving that you can do it. And that's not to disparage Ken Cragen or anyone else involved. It feels like this was a genuine and heartfelt attempt at raising money for charity. But it does mean that the event is going to become the focus. People are going to be interested because they want to know if you're going to pull it off. And a lot of people are going to get involved just to be part of the occasion, to be part of history. Which would be fine if you weren't paying a large chunk of the donations just to do the thing. And if people were paying the money they pledged and not just turning up to get the t-shirt. Which is basically what happened. So on one side you have all of these logistical problems and the biggest one perhaps is that you just don't have enough people. Now, Six million people is a lot of people but it's still not enough people. So you get stretches of the line which are just ribbon. They're just stretches of ribbon. And in places in the southwest you have ranchers filling gaps in the line using their own cattle. And then you have the problem that 
for some reason you planned your route to go through not one but two deserts and people typically can't just stand around in the desert. You need to get them in there and you can't just bust them in for 15 minutes and then bust them straight out again. So the apparent solution to this is not to redraw the route but to hire hot air balloons to make up the bit of the line that goes through your deserts. And compounding all of this is the fact that you subsequently annoy a lot of people in places your line doesn't go through and so they organised their own lines partly out of protest of being excluded. Which isn't a great look all around. On the other side you have people who really do just want to be part of history and they don't seem to care all that much about your charity or about homelessness in general. So this is how you end up with at least five couples who get married in the line or host their wedding party in the line. And at least one of those couples is pretty open about the fact that they want to have the biggest wedding in the world. And by pretty open I mean they said exactly that. You get celebrity temper tantrums such as when Michael Jackson complained that the official Hands Across America song would upstage We Are The World which he had just happened to have co-written for USA for Africa if it was played at Super Bowl 20, and so the Hands Across America song gets pulled from Super Bowl 20 and replaced with an advert. Also Michael Jackson's ego isn't hurt. We are indeed the children. And then to compound everything, Ronald Reagan turns up because he's been peer pressured into turning up and he clearly doesn't want to be there and nobody else wants him to be there and people complain because the policies of the Reagan administration had pretty much directly caused a sharp rise in homelessness and poverty throughout the 80s and Reagan obviously cared about as much for homeless people as he did for AIDS victims. Possibly even less considering that he did at least admit that AIDS existed. Incidentally, one of the announcers reporting on the event uttered this line. He did not have to leave home, the line came to him. And to this day, I don't know if it was deliberate or an unfortunate coincidence, and I don't know which is worse. So this all leaves us with an event in which a lot of people are there just to be part of history, in which time and attention is devoted to marvelling at what an achievement it is, or to the sheer number of celebrities who have turned up. In short, everyone seems to kind of forget that they're supposed to be raising money for charity and instead it all devolves into this unironic monument to the greatness of America. So ultimately, Cragen and everyone involved in Hands Across America tried to shift the focus. And I don't think it was deliberate or cynical, but more just a defence mechanism. And so the official narrative today is that Hands Across America was not an event to raise money, but an event to bring attention to homelessness in America and to inspire social activism. And arguably, if you look at it that way, it was kind of a success, a very expensive success, but it did focus a lot of media attention onto the homeless crisis and reportedly, though you can't really put a figure on it, did inspire an uptake in social activism. You could argue that following events such as the militant tent city in Portland, Maine in 1987 wouldn't have been successful if it hadn't been for that increased media attention. You could argue that. Whether that attention was worth all the money and effort it evidently cost is another question. Regardless, Hands Across America sort of fades into obscurity and everybody seems to collectively try and pretend it never existed until Us puts it back under the spotlight in 2019. And so if you're looking for information about Hands Across America today, you're going to have to wade through hours of media think pieces and hot takes on the symbolism and meaning of Hands Across America in Us, trust me I know. Having said that, Hands Across America isn't just a cultural touchstone in us, it also exists textually within the diegesis. Adelaide has a Hands Across America t-shirt, we see her watching the Hands Across America TV advert. And you have this image of the tethers subverting Hands Across America, which does invite the audience to draw an analogy between the tethers and the homeless of America, and in short it's all pretty explicit. So today. We're going to talk about us. What are you people? We 
We're Americans. Us is a 2019 film directed by Jordan Peele and starring Lupita Nyong'o as Adelaide Wilson. Ostensibly, it is a home invasion, body snatcher style horror movie in which doppelgangers appear in society and they have the apparent aim of removing and supplanting their counterparts. In execution, Us is more an example of existential horror. So this means it's less concerned with what the monsters are and more with what the monsters represent, metaphorically speaking. For an example of existential horror, in the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the generally accepted though heavily debated interpretation is that the monsters represent communism and the fear of communist infiltration into America. In Us, there are numerous ways that you can interpret the tethers, most of which would be valid, but the obvious and most explicit analogy is with the homeless communities of America. To be more specific, it's more that their society's worst and most pervasive perceptions of the homeless. And again, the film makes the analogy pretty explicit. Us has this text opening which talks about the thousands of miles of unused tunnels beneath America. The tethers live in an underground facility that's clearly not designed for human habitation, performing this kind of grotesque parody of human life. And it, it's a grotesque parody that's not even that far removed from reality. In an interview with The Wrap, Will Hunt, the author of Underground, A Human History of the Worlds Beneath Our Feet, talks about the full extent of America's underground communities. Hunt noted that there's substantial evidence that hundreds of people live in tunnels just out of view of regular society in places ranging from Las Vegas to Moscow to Bucharest to New York City. In the deeper strata of New York City you find mole people. You find people who have made homes for themselves in deep hidden nukes and alcoves under the city, he said. They're these marginalised, forgotten people who are living completely out of sight in essentially a separate reality. He mentioned a massive community that was found underneath the Upper West Side of Manhattan between the 80s and 90s where people had literally built homes out of wares salvaged from the surface. Hunt said these people had water sources, generators and had siphoned electricity to get by. So that's just one aspect of the analogy. The other aspect, arguably the more important aspect, is the aspect which portrays the tethers the way society sees and fears the homeless, namely as grotesque inversions of humanity to be simultaneously feared and reviled if society sees them at all. At any rate, that's how the tethers are introduced. They're scary monsters who look like us and break into our beach houses because they want to get rid of us and they want to take all of our nice stuff and our lives. Which is precisely what they do to the Tylers. Tex and Dahlia break into the Tyler household, murder its inhabitants and occupy the space as if it were their own. Tex puts on Josh's clothes and performs this kind of cruel mimicry of Josh. Dahlia sits in the bedroom staring into the mirror and crudely applying Kitty's lipstick. Context established, we move into the second act. The Wilsons escape from or kill their own tethers and they subsequently kill the entire Tyler household's tethers. What is essentially a very traditional and conventionally executed comic horror sequence. Abraham is churned into pieces by a speedboat motor. Tex is lured into Josh's speedboat where Gabe fails to kill him with a flare but then kills him off screen and the boat lurches comedically from side to side so you know there's a scuffle. The Tyler's daughters are summarily executed by golf club, one goes over the balcony and into a coffee table, the other is thwacked repeatedly over the head. Umbre is propelled at high velocity from the window of a moving car and dies wrapped just hideously around a tree branch. On first viewing you can feel that there's been a shift in tone. While the opening act does have a few light moments, as soon as the tethers show up it gets pretty serious and there's an almost continual atmosphere of menace and dread which it's not necessarily dispelled by the events in the second act but yeah there's a definite shift in tone. We've gone from this dark brooding menacing setup to a part of the film in which the protagonists fight back and the action ramps up. 
And as part of that, the audience who previously had been taught to fear the tethers, to see them as dangerous and unpredictable and menacing, are now invited to find them comical and pitiful, to enjoy the circumstances of their deaths, to find catharsis as they are dispatched. Part of that is the comic violence, but mainly it's in the form of these comic exchanges which punctuate the violence. So, having dispatched the Tylers, there's a brief comic interlude in which the Wilsons discuss the merits of setting up a home defence system, and it all digresses into a discussion about Home Alone. Then let's make some traps or something, like some Home Alone type stuff. That way if she comes... Tell me you did not just reference Home Alone. You Preceding Umbre's death, the Wilsons argue about who gets to drive and why, and each family member uses their own personal kill count as a metric. I have the highest kill count in the family. You don't have the highest kill count. I killed both twins. Wrong. I just killed the second one. I killed Kitty. So that's one, 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 and two. I killed two. I killed myself and Josh, so... But on repeated viewing, for reasons we're going to get into, you begin to understand that the tone during this sequence, its execution and the framing of the tethers as comic objects, as both setup and punchline, is in very deliberate contrast to earlier events. Because it's all working to re-establish a familiar in a way, comforting framework of jump scares and comic horror, and it places the tethers firmly within that framework as the monsters of the film. In these moments, they are both a frightening and genuine threat to society, and also a faintly ridiculous subversion of society, one which the Wilsons are granted legitimacy to execute and expel, and we, the audience, are invited along for the ride. But that ride has a final twist. We're human too, you know. Knives, teeth, hands, blood. In the third act, Red kidnaps Adelaide's son Jason. Adelaide pursues Red into the underground facility where the two have an encounter which ends when Adelaide stabs and kills Red. She's reunited with Jason and with the rest of the family, and they drive away while society gives a pretty good impression that it's completely fallen apart. Cue the Minnie Ripperton song everyone was obsessed with for a while. Roll credits. But not before Adelaide has a flashback. In this flashback, we find out that Adelaide is the tether, that Red is, for whatever the term means, the real Adelaide. So back in the Hall of Mirrors, when they met as children, Adelaide's tether rendered Adelaide unconscious, dragged her into the underground facility, handcuffed her to a bed, and left to take Adelaide's place above ground. So this is, in many ways, a pretty conventional plot twist. It's a subversion of audience expectation through an unexpected development. And through it, we learn something new about Adelaide. That she was born in the facility, but swapped places with Adelaide as a child, and subsequently grew up as Adelaide. Now, here's why that's important. As a plot twist, it's not really about Adelaide at all, but what it tells us about the tethers. Because the fact that Adelaide's tether grows up to live a normal life, a life indistinguishable from any other human life above ground, not just implies but states textually within the movie that this is something that is possible. A tether can live as a human. The further implication then is that there is therefore nothing inherently monstrous about the tethers rather that their monstrousness is defined by the circumstances in which they live. They are monsters because society decrees that they are monsters. They turn you into a monster and then they call you one. So us wades pretty heavily into the nature versus nurture argument and comes down firmly on the side of nurture. Having swapped places, Adelaide's tether gains access to the family therapist. Having been encouraged to express herself creatively, she gains access to professional ballet classes and she gets to perform on stage. She's taught how to speak. Adelaide's tether grows up to live in wealth. She marries a man she loves and she brings up a healthy family. She gets to move in the social circles of the rich and she has a Californian beach house. She's doing fine. Conversely, 
Adelaide, having become part of the facility, loses her privileges and her opportunities. There is no more family therapist. There are no professional ballet lessons. Her voice atrophies. There was a girl. Adelaide, now living as Red, becomes part of a system which removes people's agency and their humanity, and as such she becomes part of the disenfranchised classes. In effect, she becomes her tether's own grotesque shadow. So here's where things maybe get a little tricky, because Adelaide's dragged into the facility, but that doesn't mean she has to stay in the facility, right? So why does she stay in the facility? It's not like anything's stopping her from leaving. The escalator, the entrance is unlocked and unguarded and it's hardly inconspicuous because it's really loud and it's got that golden shimmering glow. And yeah, sure, it only goes down, but that just means you have to work hard to get up it. And why does Adelaide, once free of the handcuffs, not just walk up it? So this comment comes up time and again, and it's puzzling precisely because the movie explains it. I mean, Red has this whole monologue which explains it. The two were connected together. together. But for the sake of argument, let's talk about it. So, Adelaide being dragged into the facility represents a kind of fall from privilege and into poverty. And once she's fallen into poverty, she's immediately subsumed by and abandoned by the system. That's the point of the escalator. In theory, Adelaide can use it whenever she wants. In practice, she's now part of a community which is nothing more than a mimicry of society, just everything's much, much worse, and nobody who's subject to it has any agency or any ability to affect their own life. Adelaide, therefore, has no more agency to walk out of the facility than, say, a homeless person in America has to just decide not to be homeless. If you're homeless, just buy a house. Mm. Now, that's not to say that escape from the facility is impossible, because it's clearly not, only that it's not going to happen through personal will alone. Adelaide's tether escapes, but it's not through design. She has no agency to affect the circumstances of her own escape, only to take advantage of the opportunity if she gets it. If Adelaide chooses not to go into the funhouse, if her parents find her, if she gets distracted by something else or does literally anything else at all, her tether never escapes. And as a result, we don't have a movie. I don't want to. I want to stay down here. I want to just stay in my cozy spot. Get up and look. Jesus Christ. Ultimately, this is the debate the whole movie hangs on. Why do some people live in poverty while others live in luxury and wealth? Because it's certainly not a case of who deserves what. Adelaide's tether doesn't escape from the facility because she deserves to. She doesn't work hard to escape. It's just a momentary act of opportunity at the expense of another human being. Another human being who is in fact a child. And when you look at them, none of the Tylers or the Wilsons are really doing anything much at all that suggests they've earned their status or that they deserve their wealth. The beach house belongs to Adelaide's family, which means that Gabe has inherited it through marriage. And now he's locked in this futile game of one-upmanship with Josh. I mean, he buys a speedboat because Josh has a speedboat, but he's still frustrated because Josh's speedboat is better, and he's equally frustrated because the Tylers have a nicer car, because the Tylers have a backup generator. You saw their new car, right? You had to do it, you just had to get that thing to fuck with me too. In fact, it's pretty heavily implied that once the Tylers have been murdered, Gabe wants to stay in the Tylers' house not because it's safe, clearly it's not, but because he's finally got what he wants, Josh's life. Well, we got everything we need here. Food, water, backup generator. We're as safe here as we're gonna be anywhere. Tell that to Josh and Kitty. They're right here. And Josh himself is 
pretty much into just showing off his wealth, drinking heavily and antagonizing Kitty. <gasps> oh my God, it's OJ. It's OJ Simpson. <laughs> What is wrong with you? He seems to spend most of his nights in his recliner doing not much of anything and he doesn't seem to care about anything to the point that he's annoyed at having to get up from his recliner and go check for home invaders. Get up and take a look, I'm scared. Oh, I don't want to. I want to stay down here. I want to just stay in my cozy spot. Get up and look. Jesus Christ. Kitty's also into heavy drinking, but beyond that, she seems to spend most of her time being openly resentful of her husband. What do we say? I hate you. That works. Yeah? Yeah. Good. And less openly resentful of her daughters, who she blames for not becoming a movie star. I think I could have been a movie star if the girls hadn't been born at exactly the wrong time. It's implied that Zora could, if not reach the Olympics, at least have a solid career as a runner. Gabe encourages her to go running on the beach because it's a tougher workout. You should run on the stand. Why? Because it's harder, okay? No traction. Mm -hmm. Practice on the beach, you get on dry land, you take off. Adelaide has this whole unironic motivational thing about how Zora can do anything she puts her mind to, but apart from wanting to drive, Zora doesn't really want to do anything but spend all of her time on her phone. What? What's with all the For me. attitude? I'm sorry. Yay, track and field. Whoa, you don't want to run anymore? You love track and field. Well, what's the point? And then there's Adelaide herself, and Adelaide might just be the worst because Adelaide came from the underground facility, so she knows exactly what it's like. She knows what she had to do to get out, and yet since getting out, she's never gone back. She has never raised awareness of the Tether's existence or done literally anything to help them. And remember, she left her parents down there. So, Adelaide's a class trader. Let's just call her what she is. She's a class trader. And like all class traders, she has spent her life in constant fear that she'll be found out, that she'll be dragged back down into poverty and lose all of the money and all of the nice things that she has. My whole life, I've... I feel like she's still coming for me. And so her life is pretty much devoted to pretending that she belongs. Like I say, class trader. Now, that's not to say that any of these people are inherently bad people. They're not, they're all just comfortable, they're all just complacent. They don't need to do anything, so they don't do anything. Which is why Red pretty much has the upper hand on Adelaide throughout the film's climax. Adelaide stopped doing ballet at 14 because she didn't need to do it anymore, but it's everything to Red. It's clearly an expression of herself, something that she needs. The, her ballet is arguably more authentic and real than Adelaide's is just one more knife in the back because Red's never going to get to perform on the stage that Adelaide performed on. She is never going to be accepted in that space. So, if you wanted to argue that these people somehow innately deserve everything they have and that the Tethers somehow innately deserve to live underground in poverty, you'd be misguided at best and disingenuous at worst. The counter argument, which I think it's important to address, is that despite all of this, the tethers still instigate the violence. They come up from the sewers and the facility and they carry out an unprovoked and violent attack. That violence is the default suggests that they are completely unreasonable, that there is literally no reasoning with them. Which is factually correct. They do do that, yes. But to justify that counter-argument, you're going to need to disregard a lot of context. All of the context. Because the tethers are not unprovoked, they are very provoked by years of systemic abuse, neglect, and abandonment from the very system which created them. They created the tethered so they could use them to control the ones above. Like puppets. But they failed and they abandoned the tethered. For generations, the 
other continued without direction. They all went mad down here. In that context, you don't just get to walk up to the nearest authority and open a chain of dialogue, especially when you look like a monster, when that authority would rather you just don't exist, and when the sum total of your communicative ability outside of one representative is a lot of shrieking and a lot of snarling. Which is to say that without the threat of violence, the tellers aren't going to get justice because trying to obtain justice within a legal and social framework that's deliberately set up to deny you justice is going to work about as well as you'd expect. That's why you're in the situation. Besides, Adelaide knows who and what the tethers are, and her immediate response is the exact same fear as the rest of her family and the rest of society. Not understanding, but fear. And it's not until everything's escalated way out of control that she shows any sign that she wants to try and find some sort of reconciliation, and that extends about as far as her hand. So why would you expect anybody else to react any differently? But if you want a more concrete example of why the counter-argument doesn't hold, you just need to look at Pluto and Pluto's relationship with Jason. Because Pluto isn't initially all that antagonistic. Scary, yes. Menacing and threatening, absolutely. But not strictly antagonistic. And by this I mean that he doesn't give the impression that he wants to hurt Jason the way Umbre clearly wants to hurt Zora, or the way Abraham clearly wants to hurt Gabe. So during the initial break-in, after Zora and Umbre take off and Abraham has dragged Gabe off to the speedboat, Red instructs the two boys to go play. Go play, boys! And this is kind of what they do. So they go off hand in hand to the closet and in there there's this brief scene in which they seem to be curious about each other even though Jason is just about out of his mind with terror. They mimic each other for a bit and they show each other their faces which doesn't really help with the terror and Pluto tries to get Jason to do the magic trick. Pluto doesn't even really show any ill will towards Jason beyond frustration that the magic trick doesn't work. So it's actually only once Jason rejects Pluto by tricking him and trapping him in the closet that Pluto becomes antagonistic. And it all comes to a head in the most tragic of ways when Pluto attempts to set the car on fire with the Wilsons inside. Now, given that Jason knows Pluto will mimic him in every way, could Jason use this fact to defuse the situation? Maybe, but... It doesn't matter because he doesn't try, and instead uses that knowledge to immediately walk Pluto backwards into the fire. So if you're inclined to look at it in a certain way, there is perhaps a deeper meaning to that final scene in the car while Jason's looking uneasily at Adelaide. Because in this moment he understands who his mother is, but the implication is that by knowing this he in turn finally understands who Pluto is, or who Pluto was because he pulls the mask back over his face and it does kind of feel that in this moment it's maybe a gesture of respect and understanding towards Pluto. It's implied that maybe Jason in this moment understands his own actions, his own attitude towards Pluto, because that attitude isn't that far removed from the Tyler's daughter's attitude towards Jason himself, just without the safety net of a secure and loving environment to reassure him that there's nothing wrong with him. Your brother's so weird. He just has a hard time focusing. I don't know. It's suggested. So there's this troubling implication that I'll warn you is probably going to stay with you once you understand the full context of Hands Across America and its role in the movie. Because if Hands Across America exists diegetically within the world of the movie, and we've been told explicitly that it does, then it means that on Sunday the 25th of May 1986, as 6 million people held hands and got married and sang of the greatness of America all in the name of raising awareness of homelessness, Somewhere in an underground facility stood a line of tethers, abandoned and ignored, and carrying out their own grotesque parody of Hands Across America. So yeah, there's that.
Yeah, I'm done.